<laughs> You'll get an extra 60 seconds. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I study science communication, and um, I'd rather just tell you uh, what I know um, and, and then have you react to that. Um, but I will say uh, that I'm very grateful uh, to be invited um, because I, I'm very grateful um, to the National Academy of Sciences um, for engaging in the project of, of which I understand this to be a part, which is to remedy um, the, that's the gap between the knowledge that we have um, about uh, how to communicate science and the practice of science and, and making policy that's informed by science. And you might have been, we've been looking at this since 1969, but we learned a lot since 1969 that doesn't seem to have caught up with the, the practice. And I think that that's really unfortunate that the knowledge we have is an asset that we ought to invest commensurately with in, in delivery capability. So this is really important. So I'm grateful because it gives me a chance uh, to reciprocate um, the effort that they're making, at least try a little bit by telling you something. I'm going to try to talk a bit about uh, how people think about, about decision-relevant science and then also problems that they have with technology as they do PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just show that how to do it. And in fact, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try to model uh, uh, science communication in a little bit by using a kind of format almost like a reality TV show, right? So I'm going to present the information I have as if it were a show. It's called Public Science Comprehension, Believe It or Not, right? And it's the show where every week like, we present stories that kind of are just hard to, to kind of fathom about how the public makes sense of science that's decision relevant and relevant to their individual decisions, but also collective ones. And we have three episodes, <laughs> three stories this week. And the first one is about evolution. Right? And, and you know already that uh, about half the United States population will say that they don't believe in evolution. And that's not surprising. I don't know if it's strange or not. But it's not surprising. You hear it every, every year. Right? But the, the surprising part is, is that the half that says they believe in it, they're not going to do any better on a, on a high school biology test than the half that says that they don't believe it. Right? There's zero, zero correlation between believing, saying you believe in evolution, and being able to give a cogent, correct, high school level account of natural selection, random mutation, genetic variance, the elements of the modern synthesis and evolution. Right? And here's another thing. You can teach people the modern synthesis. We actually know how to teach evolution theory really well. But when you teach people it, it doesn't increase the likelihood that they're going to say they believe in evolution, right? And so, you know, if they didn't believe in it before, they've learned these concepts, but they're no more likely to say that they believe in it. And this is true for high school students, college students, normal adults, right? Believe it or not, you know, strange but true. And number two, climate change risk perception, right? Now, the public doesn't really understand the science behind climate change, or at least that's what was, was discovered, even when somebody thought to investigate this back in 1994, where they discovered that people who thought climate change was happening, they said, well, that uh, the problem. We have the hole in the ozone layer that's causing it. That was the number one answer. Now, in 2010, right, nobody said that, but still, most half the people didn't believe that human activity was responsible for causing the temperature of the Earth to increase through carbon emissions. And the people who did think that climate change was happening, they thought it would be a really good idea to clean up toxic waste sites. They thought that that would contribute significantly to dealing with climate change. They believe in climate change, but they don't really understand the science any better than the people who don't. But here's another thing. Right? The public generally over relies on cognitive heuristics when they're forming their perceptions of various kinds of risks, including environmental ones. Right? So this is the the uh, theme of the uh, great book by Kahneman of thinking fast and slow, right? and, and this has been connected by at least some commentators to uh, the public's failure to take climate change as seriously as they should, right? that, that, that they, they are much more uh, gripped by the compelling image of the, the fuselage on fire of sticking out of the the high-rise building, people jumping out, that gets their attention with the bear floating away and the ice is not a big deal, 
right? I mean, that's the, the conjecture, really. But here is the, the strange part. Members of the general public who are the most science literate right, and who score the highest on measures of cognitive reflection, which is the measure that people tend to use of whether the, the, someone is using the slow, conscious, reflective, deliberative form of thought that we, we characterize with, so with scientific reasoning, with understanding science and numbers and data. They're the most culturally and politically polarized on climate change. And multiple studies, including one by the work group that, I, that I'm part of, have, have shown this. Right? So, so as people become more science literate, right, as they become better at using the forms of kind of, 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 of valid, inferential reasoning, rely less on their gut feelings, they don't start to converge on what scientists believe. Right? They just become kind of more reliable indicators of what people who share their political and cultural outlooks believe, right? And the most skeptical members of the, of the, of the American public, in fact, are more science literate, more numerate than average. So are the ones who are the most concerned. That's what happens. They get more polarized. Oh, that is story number two. Story number three, we heard a little bit about it, the antibiotics, right? Now, there is no meaningful level of public disagreement, right, cultural or otherwise, on the proposition that if you don't feel well, go to a doctor. And if the doctor prescribes you some antibiotics, right, take them. And some people think you only take them for a couple of days, but take the antibiotics, right? <laughs> because people really think that the doctors know what they're talking about and they'll do what they say. Maybe they believe them even too much, right? So no controversy there. But as we already heard from Bruce, 50% <laughs> of the general public believes that antibiotics kill viruses as well as bacteria. He said they're getting better at this because we have the longitudinal evidence from the National Science Foundation indicators at 50%. Now, remember, it's only a true-false question, so they're all up to 50%. You might think, well, they're doing good <laughs> chance, finally. <laughs> but actually, you know, that, that would be unfair because they're doing better than South Korea, which is 30%, EU, Japan. You know, actually, it's not bad to be at 50% because a lot of those antibiotics kill anything. You know, that might make you sick. And that, so we're doing a little bit better, but still only 50%. I don't think that's too good, right? But better. And here's another thing. It's kind of interesting. How about this? We know a little bit more than some of these other countries, too, about the cloning. Cloning you produce a genetically identical copy, 80% of us. We know that. Fewer than in, in the EU. And I don't have the data there, but that's true of other countries, too. We do better. Yeah, we're doing better on the... On the, on the we do better on almost all of these. I think Bruce might have adverted to that. Oh, except for this one about did we evolve from the animals, right? <laughs> Where we, we do worse than everybody else. But you see what that ought to make you think is that maybe that's not measuring the same thing as the other questions, right? The people who are, get the top 90th percentile on the, the, the question, right? All the other questions. 50% of them get that one wrong. It's not measuring actually the same thing. So next time somebody tells you, hey, here's some evidence that the United States is behind the rest of the world in science literacy because we think 47%, only 47% of us believe in evolution. Look at that, 70% in the EU and 78% in Canada. First of all, we're ahead of them on the other indicators. And this is not a measure of how much science you know. So next time somebody says that, they don't know, really, the evidence on how you would try to measure what science literacy is. I mean, maybe they know whether you're scoring right on that particular question, but they're not measuring an aptitude, which I think is the point of the measure. Oh, now, <laughs> that's the end, actually, of the program. But I'm, I'm now going <laughs> to do what I told you, or what I was asked to do, right, which is tell you something about the public's understanding of decision-relevant science. I'm going to tell you five things. I'm going to try to do it quickly but they all actually are connected to things I was able to show you in that exciting episode of the public comprehension of science, believe it or not. One is that, and maybe this is, you don't even need a show for this, individuals have to accept as known <laughs> much more decision-relevant science than they could ever possibly understand because the amount of knowledge we have from science is vast. It's actually too vast for any scientist even to understand it, even probably within his or own field, but I won't say that, right? But the, but the number of things you have to know that are consequences to you will always exceed the amount of information you can really meaningfully comprehend. It will take you your whole life to try to do it, but your life will be shortened 
because you won't have time to learn things that you should take antibiotics, right, if you get sick. But this is the second point. You see, you don't have to know it. You acquire the insights of the decision relevant science by reliably recognizing who has it, right? You don't have to have a medical degree to get the benefit of what the doctor knows. You just have to know that the doctor is the one you should go to, right? So, so what if you don't know what the, the pill kills? You know to go to the doctor. That's all you need to know. And actually knowing that's pretty impressive because you could have thought, I should go to a faith healer or to a shaman and eat worms or something like this. There are some people who think that, but they're precious little of them, right? There's no cultural conflict over them. And we think that that's kind of odd. You know, you, you go to an engineer, too, if you want to build a bridge and so forth and so on. You, you, you put 100 people in a room and you say, solve this calculus problem. The odds are that one of them knows how to do it. And that four of them will say they do, right? <laughs> they come out of the room 15 minutes later and most of the time they all know the answer. Not because the one person taught them all calculus in 15 minutes, right? Because it only took that long to realize who it was who knew what they were talking about. And so people, it's, it's a rational faculty to be able to identify who knows what they're talking about. And if it weren't, if we didn't have that, science wouldn't go very far either, right? You'd have to start from the beginning. You know this in verb, but we'll talk about that last week. All right. Now, here's the third point. Public conflict, then, over decision relevant science. It's a recognition problem, not a comprehension problem. And anybody who really thinks otherwise, I mean, it's just kind of a matter of inference kind of draw a two-by-two two contingency table. It's true that the public doesn't comprehend the kinds of decision-relevant science over which we see tremendous controversy, like climate change, right? But they don't understand the kinds of science about which there isn't any controversy, right? Like whether you go to the doctor and take the antibiotics, right? Or, or you know, pasteurized milk. That's not a con that's a cultural controversy like climate change in our society, but it's not because people you know, are better at biology than climate science or the, the, the biologists were better science communicators than the climate scientists or anything like that. It's because there was no problem in perceiving who knew what about what. Right? All of these areas where there's not conflict, people don't understand what's going on, but they recognize who knows what about what. Right? In all the areas where there's controversy, they're confused about who knows what they're talking about, right? So, again, the research group I'm part of has done a study like this. The, the, the controversies over things like climate change, over the deep geologic isolation of nuclear waste, right? over whether allowing people to carry concealed handguns reduces or increases crime. Things on which, by the way, their National Academy of Science expert consensus report, right? all the, the, the groups that are divided on these things all think that scientific consensus is consistent with the position in their group, and they're right 50% of the time, right? But none of them is saying, you know, screw the scientists. The scientists are on our side. They're confused about recognition, right? And it's this kind of group it's confusion, which gets me to the, the next point. The recognition problem, you see, I want to say, if you think about this as a kind of a, a kind of polluted science communication environment problem. People have a rational faculty of recognition okay, to know who knows what they're talking about. But the same way that other faculties can be disabled by toxins, this one can too. And one of the toxins that is of the most significant, I'm going to call it antagonistic cultural meaning, people generally learn what's known to science within the groups of people who are like them, they talk to them, they get the memo, they understand each other, they fight too much with the other people. It's okay, though, because generally these groups converge on what the best evidence is. Any group that was misleading its members consistently would probably die out. Right? But every once in a while, an issue on one of these kinds of issues becomes entangled with kind of standing in the group. It becomes a kind of badge of your membership in and your loyalty to the group. right? And at that point, right, having that position is a way for you to be who you are. And the stake you're going to have in maintaining your standing within the group is often going to be much larger than the stake you have in getting it right. If I make a mistake about climate change, right, the risks and the science, my risk from climate does not go up. 
nor does the risk of anybody else I care about. I don't care enough, matter enough, as a, as a consumer, a voter, a, a, an advocate, to have an impact. Right? But if I make a mistake about the issue with, in relation to people who are like me, given the kind of significance that's now achieved as an as emblem of who belongs to this group, could be very bad for me. Right? I, I don't want to be out of line on that. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know, you know, have this position because it's the one that fits in my group, otherwise they won't trust me. But if you are good at science, you see, and you're good with numbers, you can just do an even better job. You can seek out information that, that you can then apply in a way that reinforces the connection between what you think the evidence is and your stake in forming this group congruent belief, right? And I mentioned that climate change is not the only one like that, right? You know about the HPV vaccine. We have the same controversy about it. Gee, why wasn't it, you know, Dr. knows best with the HPV vaccine? Because that one, too, became entangled in these kinds of conflicting cultural meanings. And people couldn't then recognize. They couldn't recognize. So there's studies, you see, that show we can model something like this. If you learn about the issue in the normal way from the doctor, it doesn't matter what your cultural affiliation is. But if you learn about it in a condition of controversy, well, then you really have a hard time figuring out who the experts are. And if that hadn't happened, you see, maybe it would have been the same kind of thing. We would have gone with the doctor. Well, you say, well, how do you know that? I don't know for sure, but here, another one last episode of, of the believe it or not. Yeah, so the U.S. is culturally polarized over the risks and benefits of administering the HPV vaccine to schoolgirls, boys too, now, right, to protect them from a sexually transmitted disease that actually causes a form of cancer, right? And as a result, in the U.S., we have a horribly low uptake rate, lower, lower than Canada. They actually have the national health insurance, but lower than Mexico and other countries that don't even have the national health insurance in Portugal, Peru, right? But here, the U.S. is not culturally polarized over the HBV vaccine, which also protects people from children, from a sexually transmitted disease, hepatitis B, that causes cancer, more cancer, right? Every, the CDC recommended that this, there be the universal vaccination for hepatitis B. All the states have it. Oh, they recommended this in 1994, so you think, well, before we became so polarized and so forth. Yeah, 2007, the vaccination rate for that was 93%. 94, 2008, 92, 2009, 92, 2010, 91. These are the years in which we're seeing the conflict about the HPV vaccine. HPV has a meaning, right? Our side versus their side, that's preventing recognition. This is okay. It's what the doctor tells you. He's going to jab into the arm of Jimmy or Jamie who comes in and says, hurry up, because we're on our way to soccer practice, right? And this is the last point. Protecting the science communication environment in which people are able to exercise reliably, for the most part, this recognition faculty, who knows what about what. That, too, is one of the aims of science of science communication. It's not just one thing, science communication, and you've already been talking about that. But one of the things that it is, and one that we don't think about enough, is this, right? Identifying the kinds of conditions that interfere with the operation of this rational faculty that people use, right, and, and use across the, the run of issues that are orders of magnitude larger in number than the ones on which there's polarization, and that get them to the right place, right? And maybe then we can try to forecast, you know, when something like this happened with nanotechnology, that would be a disaster, right? Let's prevent this from happening if we can, right? And, and so that's, that's part of the, of the mission, right? <laughs> the important point, this is a, the protecting the, the, the science communication environment. It's a recognition problem, not a comprehension problem. As, as valuable as comprehension is for all kinds of things, intrinsically and otherwise, the recognition problem is what's preventing us from using the decision-relevant science as much as we should. The recognition problem reflects some kind of some kind of interference with the normal cues people rely on reliably, and we can learn about this and do something right about it. Or, or we should just do what Ralph says, we should listen. 
listen to Danny Kahneman and the other scholars who are using science to improve science communication. And that's what I was talking about at the beginning. And so, do I have any time left with my 10 minutes? I just go on. No, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But that was actually a 45-minute lecture. <laughs> so, 